Hello, everybody. It's Stephen and Walter here for another episode of So Chatty. It is episode number 91, and it is February the 10th, 2023. So before we get into the main topic today, which you saw from the uh, title of today's video, we're going to talk about 3D printing and how you can use 3D printing in your quilting or sewing room as well. Yes, you can. And we have some things to show about that. And this is a topic that came from one of my subscribers who said she didn't own a 3D printer, but she'd really be interested to see what they're all about. And of course, on my vlog, you know, I have a section every week where I talk a little bit about the things I've been making with 3D printer. But today I'm going to specifically talk, we're going to specifically talk about things that are related to your sewing room, your quilting life, things like that. But before we do that, Here's what I've been working on or what I have finished. So this is the Cleopatra fan block that I did a table runner from. It's actually a pattern that came with the AccuQuilt die that cuts these all out. And you can see it's all quilted and everything. And I think it turned out not bad at all. The colors are nice and bright. I kind of like that. And then I must have been on a table runner mode here i also have a bear paw accu quilt die and i did this quilt and those circles you see are actually printed on the fabric i had uh three different colorways of this fabric in my stash which i bought six months ago and forgot all about promptly and so that's what i made this from and it was a pretty quick little project uh, I've always wanted to make a bear paw quilt so now that i have the accu quilt die for this um, I can probably turn my attention to that. And of course, it's all quilted as well. And that's not where I wanted to go there. So what's Walter been working on? Mm, nothing. Well, you actually have been, but he's been putting the final touches on our trips that are yeah. coming up in the next few months and a new trip to tell you about in a moment as well. Yes, this is the year of the trips. But before we get into that, uh, I want to talk about the Sewers Club. Uh, if you saw this week's Idiot Quilter, I did show you uh, February's box. They seem to get them out pretty early. Like, I got notification that they had shipped that box on about January the 30th. So it came, and it came relatively quickly. Um, now, you know that I am an affiliate with them. There's a discount code in the show notes below. And if you click on that, uh, it'll take you to their site and I get eight bucks. I'll be upfront about it. I get eight bucks for every box that people subscribe to. Um, however, I was not that impressed by this month's box. Okay, I'm just saying. Uh, I didn't find that the colors in it um, were really in my wheelhouse. Uh, the prints on them were okay, but they weren't my style. Now, you curate what you want uh, from a list of things that they have. And I think I originally, there was a lot of floral in this particular box. And I thought I had clicked floral off, but then I may have clicked it back on because I thought I was maybe limiting. It's not that I hate florals. They're just not something I necessarily gravitate towards unless they're cave facet uh, than I do. But uh, anyways, I sort of rated it. If you haven't seen the, the episode of Idiot Quilter, I rated each one of the 15 fat quarters that were in the box on a scale of one to five. And most of them were three, three and a half. So we'll see. The reason I'm bringing this up is, um, although I'm an affiliate, we'll see. Next month's box, if it's kind of like... Can you check to see what you've got checked off? No, I tried to go in and see, and I can't, mm. I can't see it. Uh, there's no way I can figure that well, out. Well, that means that's kind of inflexible that you can't change it. Yeah, maybe I should write to them and ask them if you can yeah. change it. That's actually, that's a good point. Maybe I'll send them an yeah. email and ask if there's a way that I can go in and uh, refine my selections or whatever. Um, it's good quality fabric. I mean, there's, and the price is okay. I mean, we're talking here that the price is about less than $4 a 
uh, a fat quarter, which right now the average fat quarter is being sold for about four fifty to five dollars. So uh, Canadian, Canadian, yeah, we're talking everything in Canadian. Um, it's a better deal for the Americans actually on the subscription box, and they do have more than one subscription box you can go to, and you can cancel any time, and you don't have to get them every month either. Well, so what you get? You how much do you estimate each quarter? A fat quarter is about. 350 maybe 375 okay so, so we'll take take 66 dollars and divide by 15 because that includes the shipping okay uh let me just uh calculators out there 66 yeah divide, divide by, by 15, 15 is 4. 440 so four dollars and 40 cents canadian a fat quarter that's including all the shipping yeah, just a sec so 440 canadian you know, you're figuring out for American dollars, yeah. are you? Uh, it works out to it works out to three dollars and thirty cents a fat quarter American. Well, I don't know. US dollars. People would have to tell me because I don't know what Americans are paying for fat quarters on average. But in my way of thinking, that's not bad uh, for that. So I don't I don't think it is bad value for the money. I just was a little disappointed in the selections. Now, I know you're not going to get a box of 15 fat quarters and you're going to absolutely love everyone that's in the box. And I, I will say that they coordinate them in the box. It's like they put three or four out of the 15 or three of that sorted that'll go well together. So now, they think about it. Isn't there different subscriptions? Yes. Than, uh, you get 15 fat quarters. Yeah, there's one that's a project box too, which is a little less expensive. And I think it has free shipping on it. And it's a, a project, if you know, if you are into that. I, I didn't wasn't interested in doing projects each month like that. I've got enough projects on the go with it. Yeah. So I, I'm not, I'm still reserving my opinion. I'm going to wait and see what next month brings because next month means that I've gotten four months then of them. The other two boxes I got, um, I was a little bit more impressed with those boxes than I was with this one. So maybe it's off month. I don't know. I kind of thought they might, because it's February, had a lot of things that might deal more with uh, Valentine's Day. And I know that I did check off the box. There was one that said it's seasonal. And I did check that one off to, to be included. But mm. really, there wasn't anything in there. There was one solid red. And I think there's another with a little red in it, but nothing that I that screamed out to me Valentine's Day. Not necessarily that that's a bad thing because I don't, I don't make Valentine's quilts or things like that. But I just thought that was a little unusual. So I don't know. I still haven't made up my mind a hundred percent. But I will say that I don't resent spending the money. It's kind of fun to get the box. Um, for sure and as i said the fabric is all good quality name brand fabrics with it so anyways you know the best part is though if you decide to go for it and try it out and make up your own mind you can cancel at any time so you're not you know you're not in it for say a year or something like that okay so tomorrow february the 11th saturday at the time of this recording we're having a pop-up so day. Yep, starts at 8 a.m., which means in Walter's time zone, that'll be more like after lunch. Um, he won't be awake at 8 a.m. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, for those of you that have been around, you know what we do. It's just come whenever you want, leave whenever you want. You don't have to be there right at 8 o'clock. Um, and uh, it'll run until approximately 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And we just work on whatever we want to work on. And it's open to everybody. Anybody who wants to create something or are working on something. Doesn't matter what it is, whether it's sewing, quilting, or something else. It, it everybody is welcome to it. So uh yeah, that's tomorrow. The Zoom link for that is in the show notes below. Those of you on my mailing list have already gotten that as well in your email box. Um, so it should be fun. Okay. Uh, I want to thank everybody who has sent me. Uh, suggestions for interviews and that doesn't mean to stop doing that keep doing it i have got some interviews like they're starting to pile up i have 
five interviews. I did one on uh, this past Tuesday. It'll go up next week. I've got one scheduled that I'm going to do on Sunday. I've got, and I've got three more next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I have an interview each day. So that'll spread it out. That's about uh, five weeks worth of interviews. Um, I have a few other feelers out there as well. So, you know, if you can think of somebody or something, remember, I would prefer that they have a YouTube channel and that they're somebody who doesn't have 50,000 subscribers. They may only have a couple of thousand subscribers or even just a few hundred or whatever, because I'm hoping to. And that they're help. a channel you enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. A channel you enjoy as well. Okay. Um, now, I will tell you. There are a few names out there that have come in and I have sent emails to it and I have never, I've either not gotten a response from them or I haven't, um, or they are, they just say no. Um, and that's fine. Um, it's the ones I don't get any response from at all, one way or the other, that kind of bother me. Um, you know, like a lot of you want me to interview this guy called Dave, who has a youtube channel and he does some he breaks all the rules when it comes to quilting like the quilt police would die if they ever saw what he does but his stuff is really interesting i've reached out twice to him uh and no response so i don't know if me he's not getting the emails but whatever um i even tried my hand at reaching out to uh anna from the quilt ro roadies um now she's a little bigger Okay, she doesn't really fit my criterion completely, but I think she'd be an interesting interview. And I haven't seen any interviews with her on YouTube. And I really like her channel and I like her, but I'm not getting any answers there either. So at all. So, you know, that's what happens. Um, so don't think because I haven't interviewed someone that you have suggested that you really think I should, that I haven't tried. I have. I just get turned down. Um, so Becca, I was turned down. She's too busy. But she's another one that's got, you know, a very large following. I think about 17,000. So, you know, the bigger you are, the more busy you are, I guess. Whatever. But keep them coming in. Um, okay. So, yeah, I think that's all I need as far as news is concerned. So. We're going to talk about 3D printing. And yeah, so 3D printing is not really something that comes to mind with selling. No, it doesn't. And I think that's why that the one subscriber mentioned it to me. Um, but you know, if you watch my vlogs and things when I talk about 3D printing, I have done a lot of things that involve sewing. So we thought we'd explore this topic a little bit more today. But first of all, we're just going to show you what these things look like. In fact, Behind me, they are working away. All three of my 3D yeah, printers. So you are might be hearing that they're working, but well, you probably won't because I will have uh when I edit this video, I will put in voice enhancement. So it'll focus more on our voices than the noises that are happening from behind us. Uh, but in the meantime, so what we're going to do is Walter's going to man the camera, and I'm going to just talk a little bit about the printers and uh what you're seeing now you have a specific kind of printer right? yes i do and we'll talk about that at that point in time too you're jumping ahead of the agenda well, i'm asking questions because but people need to ask questions well fine well i hope you will continue to ask questions when i'm showing the printers because you didn't tell me i couldn't ask questions no i did not you may ask questions not right now okay wait until we get over to the printers let's do that shall we Okay, so here is what I call my 3D printing mill. Uh, it means that I have more than one 3D printer, and I do. So let me talk a little bit about what you're seeing here. Um, we'll come back to this one, because this one's special. But these two are identical. Now, these are Creality Ender version 2s. Um, Creality is a company, they're Chinese-based, but they sell a lot of 3D printers. And these are a great printer if you want to just get into using a 3D printer because they're not that expensive. I think you can purchase one of these on Amazon and that's where I got mine. All of them came from, well, except for one, came from Amazon. And at the time, I think they ran me 
uh, a little under $400 a piece. I think they've gone up, that's Canadian dollars, so the cheaper for Americans. Um, I think they're running a little bit more than that now, but I'm not sure. Uh, but there's all kinds of other places where you can get these particular models. And why this model? Well, as I said, it is a good entry-level 3D printer. Um, they're not plug-and-play, however. Some assembly is required on these ones. Um, the very first one, which is actually this one right here, this the very first one that I got, this took us, what, three, four hours to put together? <laughs> yeah. And we were watching a YouTube video, and they don't come with a lot of instructions. Um, in this day and age, anything that comes from China, you know what the instructions are like. Poorly written and not much, not much of them, information in it. And that's what these are like. However, once you get them together, then there's a lot of other things you have to do. Um, there is a learning curve. In fact, it's an ongoing learning curve uh, with it. And I have learned a lot over the, what have I had them now? Two years, probably about that. So what you are seeing here is actually a very simple device when you think about it. You have a framework that holds a platform. This platform is where the 3D pr uh, print is made. It sticks itself on there and this is heated. And there's certain temperatures you use for certain things you're going to do. I'm not going to get into that. But this is a heated bed. This is your x-axis, this is the y-axis, and this is the z-axis. So it goes back and forth, forward and back, up and down. And essentially there's a little computer, uh, a motherboard in this, that you program and it tells the machine where to go to drop filament and this is what we're talking about filament it's plastic it comes on rolls you can see there's some on the wall back there it's called PLA which stands for poly blah 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 something about a three mile long polycarbonate something or another right is yeah that, something yeah. like that essentially this is plastic but it's its base is cornstarch this will dissolve over time. It is biodegradable. Um, so first of all, for those of you that are uh, mindful of the uh, ecology, this is not bad for uh, the ecology. However, there are all kinds of different plastics you can get and they're made out of different things. And some of them are not good for the environment or they're, they're not biodegradable as such but this stuff that i use primarily is do i have a lot of this oh yeah oh yeah cupboards full of it and uh these all come from different companies some of them um there are some that you won't want to use because they're crap mm -hmm. and then you get to know which ones are going to work with your machine do you have a favorite yes yes i do uh, my favorite right now is, well, my favorite used to be this one, M3D. This one is a really good filament. It's not a bad price, and you might want to know how much these cost. On average, it's about $30 a roll, and there is a kilogram in weight on each roll. Yeah, so that works out. To a kilogram is 2.2 pounds. Pounds, yeah. And that's how they measure it. They don't measure it by how many feet are on it. Uh, I'm not really sure why. But at one kilogram is pretty much the standard weight. Now, you get a lot of prints out of it. Um, in a moment, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, so there's a, little, a fair amount of money tied up in this, as you can see. And I get a lot of my filaments from Amazon. But lately, I've been buying them from another company uh, called 3D Printing Canada. And uh, that's these filaments that are here. And their filaments are a little less expensive than the ones I showed you a moment ago and only by a couple of bucks. But I've had great success with them. I've had tried other brands. There's one called Sunan, Sun, Sun, something. I don't even have any more. So you're, you're finding that some print, some filament doesn't work as well as others. Yeah. And you might say, well, why is that? Because it's plastic. Well, depending on the color, you notice that I've got quite a few colors here. Uh, there's a gold one here, for example. 
this isn't necessarily in order to make the pigment pigment they may put additives in to make certain colors uh with it and those additives mean it's not pure plastic and so when it's melting at the temperature it might not melt evenly it might not melt properly so you have to play around with it um but that's essentially it so what does a 3d printer do then the program says pull the filament through and this is called the hot end and there is a little device inside there that gets really really hot and this plastic is forced uh there's something called uh an extruder this is an extruder this little wheel it's grabbing the uh filament and if i take this wheel off here you can see the filaments going through these two little rollers and there's a motor underneath that it's called a stepper motor and it's pulling the filament through and it's forcing it down into this tiny little nozzle end and because that is really hot it's melting it as it goes in there and it's coming out the bottom and the motion of the platform the up down forward and back left and right according to the program that's built into this that's how it makes the um item and it's just laying down a layer and when it gets finished one layer it lays another layer on now these are tiny tiny little layers of plastic um, really 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 thin right? really really thin and that builds up the item now what can go wrong with this? Oh, so many things. Like I said, this is not plug and play. Plug and play meaning you can't just take it out of the box like you're and assume printed. that it's going to work. Like, like a paper. Like a, like if you take if you buy a toaster oven and yeah. you want to make toast, you don't have to do anything to it to toaster oven. You just put toast in no. it, right? Whereas this one, you have to. You yeah. have settings you have to put together. I'm going to show you how you get. The things that I'm printing here, where they come from, and what you have to do to them beforehand. But there are all kinds of adjustments that you need to make, and not every. And these are called models. The uh, the actual items they're called models. Not all models will work on all brands of printers, and you won't know until you start. And then you can have all kinds of fun, like you could wake up in the morning if this is printing overnight, because these things are not fast. Um, and have spaghetti well what's so, spaghetti well it means that for some reason your layers didn't stick together but it's still shooting out plastic so it's just strands of plastic you didn't come out with a huge hairball uh from it ask me how i know because it's happened on more than one occasion um you might get halfway through a print and one layer didn't print properly so you have a weak part and it drops off and then you have more spaghetti on top of it uh fell fell off the plate off the bed because it wasn't sticking properly um yeah lots of problems you can have with these things and i have had my fair share ask walter he knows when i'm not having a good day with the printers because there's a lot of words come out of my mouth about these things so anyways both of these printers are exactly the same printer this one i bought a little later because this one was giving me a lot of trouble and i thought okay it's done i need to replace it well while i was waiting for this one to come i figured out how to fix it and this is the other thing you have to be a tinkerer you have to have a lot of patience and you have to be someone who's willing to play with parts you know you have to be willing to pull it apart and put it back together again yep. and buy new parts and put it together sort of like yeah. a sewing machine repair guy yeah yeah it's the same thing but with everything i've ever repaired on these i have learned something about it i could from the parts raw parts i could build one of these myself now i'm pretty sure of that if i got all the parts for it and i have spare parts because things wear out there's a little nozzle for example and these are what the nozzles look like this is my little drawer of nozzles i have many many nozzles they come in different sizes i tend to use only one size but those are nozzles they're brass and there's a little tiny hole very minute. I don't know if you can see that at all. Oops, I got it turned the wrong way, so you can't see it. Let me take one out of the bag. And then you'll have a better idea of what I'm talking about here. Okay. This is a nozzle, and it screws into that hot end I told you about. And see, there's a little teeny hole right there. That's what that filament is being forced through. 
and this is really really hot when it's in the machine yeah so it melts the plastic and it shoots through the hole in and starts making the 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 um the model, model. now this is made from brass brass is a very soft metal and when you combine it with heat and forcing something through it they will wear out so you need to replace these that's why you see i have so many how long does one of these last it depends on how many prints you're doing and they can clog and clogs are not fun but there's ways to unclog it so you need to have a supply of these this is the one thing you need to purchase right off the bat and they're cheap they're not that expensive you can get a lot of them for like under $20, you get a whole big bag of them, kind of a thing, on Amazon. And that's the one advantage of having one of these types of printers, these Cruality ones. All the parts for these are available on Amazon. Now, there are other makes of 3D printers, many, and they range in price from a couple hundred bucks up to thousands of dollars. But getting parts for them may not be as easy this is a very popular brand so amazon has them uh the parts for it so when i was fixing this one this one came took us a lot less time took me a lot less time to put this together because i didn't need walter this time it's a one-man <laughs> thing i did it in under 30 minutes because i know how they go together now it's not that scary once you've done it once but i fixed this one so that's why i have two mm -hmm. now and I'm constantly tinkering with them. Now, this one, though, is a special machine for a couple of reasons. First of all, this looks a little different than that one if you look at the way the screen is, because this is an original Cruality Ender, if you so wish. It's a model version one, one, right? Model one. The other two are, are version two, and they are a little bit, they have a little bit more sophistication to them, but not a lot. Um, this one was given to me by a friend. He had gotten it, got into 3D printing, hated this machine, couldn't get it to work, couldn't get the bed to level, you have to level the bed and things like that. And he says, here, you just take it. And I said, I'll buy it from you. He says, no, it was because I was cleaning out my crafting stuff at the time and his mom came over because she's a friend of mine and she uh, took a half ton truck load of stuff away from here. Literally, really did. Um, so I had this. Well, I looked it over. Well, he didn't have it together uh, completely right. Uh, so I tightened up a few things. I got the bed level. Worked like a charm. Now, you'll notice though this is looking a little different than the one that's on this one. This is a new acquisition. I decided I was having a lot of problems with this one uh, for one reason or another, and I didn't seem to be able to fix it. So I thought, you know, this is a junker machine. It's cost me nothing. I'm going to try this kind of drive. This is the hot end, but it's called a direct drive. If you notice, there's a little blue tube here, and that's what guides the filament through this one. This one doesn't have a tube. The filament goes right down inside the motor directly. Direct drives, well, the the uh, jury is still out in this, whether they're better than the what they call a Bowden tube. That's what the tube is called. Whether these work better. But I've been having really good luck with this. But this was a major... Um, undertaking to install it. At least I thought it was going to be. So I always hesitated from buying one. To buy the part for this was under $50. So it wasn't expensive, came from Amazon. But I figured it out. And actually, this is the thing that I know now, if I want to ever upgrade these ones or whatever to this kind of setup, not a problem. Easy peasy uh, with it. But that is because I've been doing this for two years. So I had this all figured out. So here you can see they're printing some things right now. And what I'm printing, I'm going to cut in front of the camera, is I'm printing some of these. These are my little sewing. Uh, this and, will be a uh, pin cushion. Yeah. And this is for clips. Mm -hmm. And I give these as gifts uh, to people I know. And uh, so that's one of the practical prints. I call it a practical print for sewing. But you could use it as a holder for pencil or for some smaller tools whatever and how long would it take to print one of those well right now if you take a look at the ones that are here because this is being printed on this printer and that printer it's at 53 percent and it says there's seven hours and 47 minutes left to go 
in this print. So about 14 hours? Probably about 15 hours in total okay. to print. Uh, so this will be printing during through the night. And tomorrow morning when I get up, all going well, they should be done. And what the printer does is it turns itself down when the print is done. Now this is not a sewing item, but I'm making these for Easter because this one takes about, well, it's saying right now 72 hours and 37 minutes and it's only at 2%, but this one just started. The timing that are on these alters all the time, it, that won't take 72 hours. This will take probably about 28 hours to print. So yeah, they're not a little over a day. Yeah, so now a day and four hours. Yeah. Now some prints I have had some prints that have taken me four days, twenty four hours a day, to print, which are bigger than these and more complex than these. But yeah, these things they just don't generate them out like a replicator on Star Trek. Okay, it's going to take quite a while. So I do have my systems hooked up to big blocks here. These are UPS on uninterrupted power supply because if your power goes down and you're halfway through one of these long prints it could be game over although these printers are equipped with an automatic uh, resume which does seem to work okay so it means that if the power went goes off on this one when the power comes back on it will pick up where it left off um, they have to heat up but it knows to do that and, and everything to to melt the plastic but I have those there as more of a safety item Will they catch on fire? Not supposed to. They have something in them called a thermal overrun, which means if something went, there's a, a system in here, a thermistor, thermistor that reads the temperature of the hot end, and it brings it up to the temperature that you want it to be at, and it maintains it at that temperature. But if for some reason the thermistor wasn't working pro pro correctly, and it was starting to heat up way fast, the system will stop it'll shut it down. That's called a thermal overrun. But as an added feature, I have this here because I have these plugged into a little device, a special Wi-Fi plug that allows me to, wherever I am from my phone, turn them off. So in the case, in this case of an emergency, I could turn them off from wherever I was. And I have cameras by these. Uh, there's one over there in the corner that, uh, shows me this one and there's another one over here that shows me this one so I can go onto my phone with these cameras or Wi-Fi cameras and I can check what's going on in here it's a lot of cameras in this room actually you check on a lot of things so that's essentially how a 3d printer works pushes plastic through a really small little nozzle that's really hot so it melts it lays it down in layers okay so what I'm going to do next is we're going to take you uh, take you over to the other machine or to the computer and I'm going to show you some pictures of things that are geared towards filters and sewers. Okay, so we're back at the main computer and now I'm going to show you some pictures of just things that I have all over the house here um, that I use with my quilting and sewing. And Walter does too because he has some of these as well. So the first one I'm going to uh, show you is I have a thing for gnomes and everybody knows I have a thing for gnomes. This is a little gnome that has a ledge that you can hold a pad on or you could mount your uh, phone on it as well. If you want to take, uh, you know, uh, a selfie or you're doing a video of something you're working on and you need your hands free, you can use that. That was made with the printer. Where's my thing? I'll go to the next one. And that's what it looks like with the pad on it. Kind of hides the <laughs> little gnome's face. He's too hiding. big of a pad. Yeah, that's too big of a pad. I have other ones, though, that I use to hold uh, small sticky note pads uh, as well. Now, this is a contraption that I made. This is a, a modified print. It was originally, if you look at the black and you look at the white, you can see those are ruler holders um and that's what they were designed for except i added this back part onto it because there are ways that you can alt customize the prints put it that way the models so it would hold my rotary cutter 
and uh, a pad of paper and whatnot. And this sits right on my cutting table. I use it every day. So these two items, first of all, the little blue bowl. You're going, oh, it's a bowl. Isn't it cute? Yes, it is. Why do I have a little bowl there? Well, you can see. When I've got clips on something, like I'm doing my binding or whatever, I take all my clips and I just throw them in the bowl right beside me, and then I can dump them into the main tray. The big conglomerate thing that you see there is actually something that uses the empty spools of filament. That's the black parts that you can see, not the little turn table. I bought that separate. And then, but I made these little drawers and uh, they swing out and hold things. And I put it on this little cheapo turntable because uh, this is where I keep my most uh, used tools that I need all the time. And in the center core, I made a little cup that sits in there and holds all those other things. Very handy. Not maybe the prettiest item on your sewing uh, table, but it's functional. It works very well. Another little tray and a pin cushion. I make a lot of pin cushions. And, and it looks like a thimble. And it looks like a thimble. In fact, that's what orig the original design was. It was an actual thimble. Um, I blew it up. I made it bigger and made it into a pin cushion. And because I'm, I like to have a few of my clips right by me and my uh, seam ripper and my stiletto, I made this little tray and it sits right underneath the throat of my sewing machine where it's handy. Again, something I use all the time. Bobbin holders. There are tons. I should vacuum some of the little threads yeah. out of that. A little dusty on that one. But uh, there's all kinds of bobbin holders that you can download and print out. And this is just one that I cobbled together from various components. And it sits underneath my extended table and uh, collects dust. And collects dust. No, actually, <laughs> right now, when I took that picture, it usually has more bobbins than oh. what's in there now. Um, this is another one of those ruler racks. This one I use uh, to hold my smaller rulers. Um, you can print them longer than that, but you are limited by the size of the bed. Um, but there's nothing saying I can't make multiples of those for longer rulers, and I would just glue gun them together and yeah, glue them together. Right? Yeah, and that's exactly what you saw that one I showed yeah. at the very beginning. That's how that one works. And then you can have some fun, different colors of uh, filament you can get. This is rainbow filament. Yeah, and that's just all on one spool, yeah. though, right? And, yeah. yeah. In fact, that's what the bunnies that I just showed you, they're being made with, too. They just don't look as the length before it changes color varies on different brands. And you really can't tell. It depends on the size of the print, things like that. This one came out pretty good uh, with it. And again, what I did was I took a model of a gnome, and I took a model of the thimble, I blew up the thimble, I played around with the size of the gnomes, and I merged them together in software, which you're going to see in a few minutes, to create this interesting little thing that holds some of my not so frequently used tools. Of course, then you can make storage containers, another one made with that uh, rainbow thread, and this has a screw lid on it, and it could be used for Lots of different things. I use it. I have a real, that's a, a fairly large one. It's hard to see the size of that one. I've made them in smaller versions as well. But this one holds um, little square, uh, two, in, two and a half inch squares. Uh, I have always a bunch of two and a half inch squares, you know, leftovers from things that I use as leaders and enders. But I will take two of those squares and do a quarter inch seam allowance as I'm putting it underneath the needle as a leader. And then I pull them out and I throw them in there. And when I get enough of them, I can make something like a quilt or something. Okay, this is a real practical print. Um, I did not make the funnel, although you could if you wanted to, um, but I made the little watering can. That's the can that I use to fill the water reservoir in my uh, iron. And I have an industrial strength iron, the kind that has, you know, it'll hold four liters of water uh, in it. And they, it's sort of like what you'd see at a dry cleaners. In fact, that's exactly the one that they do use at dry cleaners kind of a thing. 
Walter bought it for me a while ago. Uh, and it's a great iron. Uh, but this is what I use to put the water into it because it has a very small hole. So if you're to pick up your bottle of distilled water, I use distilled water. They recommend it 50-50, 50% distilled, 50% tap. Um, I would have it all over the place. Um, so I use the funnel in that hole and I put the water into this because it's easier and there's pour it from that. Here's a variety of little things, little baskets you can make because can you ever have too many baskets? And I'm obsessed with these thimble cups, but I use them for, you know, uh, when you're trimming off things, you're over by your uh, pressing area and you get little threads attached to something and you just cut them off. Well, I just throw them into that little thing there. It's like a little waste paper basket and dump it when it's full. Bookends. This is something you know. I have a better shot of these bookends a little bit further on here, but yeah, gnomes. But I made bookends for some of my uh, project binders. Okay. You know when you need to cut a circle, and you may not have a template for that size, and templates are expensive. So I made a whole bunch of templates in different sizes. Uh, I've got them as small as one inch, and they go right up to about six, six and a half inches um, around. And you can use your rotary cutter with these because these are, well, you can see how thick they are. Um, and then uh, that box was actually a half-finished project that didn't work out, but it holds them very nicely. Another variation on a pin cushion with a gnome who's doing, uh, you know, meditation. And this one I glued, you actually can see the glue on this one, uh, this to this oval piece, because the idea here is, again, it's another thing. You could throw your clips in there, and then you got a pin cushion combo kind of thing. Behind it are magazine racks that I sized to fit the size of patterns. Yeah, so you, you actually printed those, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Everything you see right there, I've printed. Now, this is one of my favorites. This is my waste basket for when I'm cutting my scraps up and everything. And well, what are you grabbing it? Yeah, I just grab it. Just give you an idea what size yeah. it really is. Okay, here, I'll just switch over so we can see this. Okay, Walter's got in his hand. So that's the size of it. That is those little thimbles. They started out as a little thimble. And I was able to blow them up and create this now, how long does it take to want to make? Oh, this these? one takes, uh, this is one of those prints that takes about four to five days total. I made one for Walter too, but his is in two colors. Yeah, because it failed, right? <laughs> it failed. Halfway so, through it failed. Uh, at around the rim, he had to uh, he uh, he had to print a separate rim. And it's in a different color. It's in a different color. I thought that would be fun. And then I glued the two pieces together. Still working, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. working fine. fine. Yeah, I love these. This is one of the best things that I've ever printed with my printer as far as uh, things for sewing and quilting. Because they look good on your, your table. They don't take up a lot of room. But you see, I throw, show the inside. See, I throw all my little cuttings and things off into that and then dump them out later. So, yeah, it works very well. Um, And you already saw this, but I'm showing it again to you because that now that you've seen the garbage can, the thimble, this was just another change the dimensions on it. And it's a little, uh, you know, storage thing for actually for the threads that come off my uh, embroidery machine when I'm trimming them. I throw them in there and then I throw them out later. Uh, it doesn't take up a lot of space and it fits right next to my embroidery machine. Now, not these things. Those are weights. But so are these. These are, could be pattern weights, fabric weights. What they are is those little jars that I was showing you that I had the gnomes on the outside of them, but I didn't put the gnomes on them. Uh, they screw on. And what's inside of them? Pennies. I had all kinds of pennies. And in Canada, we don't use the penny anymore. So, but they make a great weight. So because these lids screwed off, I threw all the pennies in those, screwed them back on. And when I need uh weights sometimes to hold down my fabric for whatever i just use these uh for it and there's some more pin cushions in the thimble and there's the one of my little jar guys 
And that's what the bookends actually look like. That's another set that I made uh, up as well. And they do the job. And yeah, and just this is in Lucy's room where my long arm is, Lucy. And this is something I did not make specifically for this purpose. It was a desk set. It's one of the earlier prints that I made. And it was a place for you to actually, I put sticky notes on it. But that's actually to hold your cell phone. And there's a little thing at the back for, you know, miscellaneous items. And it holds pens. And it's got uh, a sticky note holder as well. I use it actually for throwing my bobbin cases. And some of the stuff I reach for when I'm using um, Lucy. And the little thing beside it is a just another little garbage can. It's actually supposed to be a flower pot, but it was an extra thing I had. And um, I throw like when I'm and when you're long arming, you know, you're going to have threads come up between your seams all the time. So you're constantly cutting them off, pulling them out or whatever. I just it's more convenient for me to throw them in this little thing than it is into a garbage can because my garbage can sits underneath Lucy. And when I've got a quilt on it, I can't get at it. And then at Christmas time, I gave uh, to a few ladies at Ultimate Sewing a seam ripper. That's a little known seam ripper printed on the uh, 3D printers. The I made them, I bought a whole bunch of seam ripper inserts from Amazon. They're not the best in the world. They're kind of cheap, but they do the job. And I made it in such a way that I could drop one of those right in. I just put a little glue on them so they'll stay in. And uh, the other one is Santa Claus as opposed to a gnome pin cushion so santa's got his pin cushion on his back right there just kind of fun things so there's lots of things you can make that have to do with quilting but there is more you just saw some of the novelty items that i have made here but where do you get all of these things well i have a little uh video clip that i made that i'm going to insert here now that explains a site that's called Thingiverse, where all these things you've seen today, I did not pay for any of them. Yeah, so they're like uh, embroidery files almost, if, yeah. you, if you want to look at it. They're special, but they're 3D print files. Yeah, they don't go in your embroidery machine. They no, no, your... like it's the same sort of idea. You've got a special pattern. Yeah. Right, that you download. Yeah, right? that you download the file, and then there's something you have to do to make the file work in your 3D printer. And I have a little video that, that'll be part of this video that I'm going to insert right here. So here's what we're talking about. So how do I get the different things that I create? Where do I find the models? That's what they are called. They're called models. And there are several sites on the internet that you can go to and you can download free all kinds of literally hundreds of models that you can print uh, with your 3D printer. So if I'm looking for something that's related to quilting or sewing, I go into Thingiverse. Thingiverse is a site that has thousands upon thousands of models that you can download for free. So up here in the search bar I'm showing you, um, I'm just going to do a search using the word quilting. Oops. Once we get it clicked on, quilting. And you're going to see it's going to come up with all kinds of things. It comes up with ruler racks, a uh, binding spool, they call it. Uh, the idea behind that is I actually printed it out once, but I never use it. Uh, it sits on top of uh, an extra spindle on your sewing machine and you can thread your uh, binding through it and it'll roll off neatly. I use a different method, but that's a possibility. There's an embroidery hoop. There are templates here as well uh, for these are uh, different sizes of trapezoids. Um, there's even square rulers. Now, the one thing about printing a ruler on a 3D printer, uh, they're showing this one, for example, as being clear. Well, you can't really print absolutely clear um, plastic. At least I don't think you can. I do have something that's called transparent, but it's a bit cloudy. Um, also, these marks that they're showing on here wouldn't show up like this because this particular picture is for what they call a CNC uh, laser cutter, which 
actually uses acrylic, but you will find a mixture of those kind of things uh, in Thingiverse as well. Uh, over here, a roll and press. Now, for some items like this, you would need some additional pieces that you can't print out on your printer, like screws and bolts and things like that, but they're very easy to get. You can get them from Amazon. Um, but you can see all the different things. There's a quilting measuring gauge. Um, I did actually print this out at one time to give it a try. Mm, didn't really like how that worked. That's the other thing. Some of these things look really good when you find them on here, but when you go to do the actual printing, depending on the printer you have, the plastic you're using, all that kind of stuff, they may or may not work out very well. Um, here's a quilting thread cutter. And I believe this one uh, you put together, you put a, in a used uh, blade from a rotary cutter for this. And it goes on. There are pages and pages of these kind of things. Uh, bobbin holders. Um, feet. You can actually print feet for your sewing machine. I have never tried that. I don't know if I would want to try that um, because mm, the plastic that you're using uh, it depends on the type you're using, are not necessarily the strongest. Um, I think they could break very easily. So I wouldn't want to fool around with something like that. But some people do. Um, as I said, there's all kinds of templates as well that you can print out. Um, gauges, uh, thimbles. In fact, that's how I printed out uh, my large thimble garbage can. And let me show you what that looks like. So I'm just going to move out of this and I'm going to call up a different program. Now this is a program that is, okay, let me get this so we can see it. There we go. So this is a program called Cura. There are many different programs that do the same thing as Cura does. This is the one I use because it's the one that came with my 3D printers and it's a free program. It is what they call a slicer. Once you get a model and you download it to your computer, before you can print it, you have to put it into this slicer program in order to create a file that your 3D printer can read. The files you usually put in a slicer end in the extension STL. They're called STL codes and that stands for something but don't ask me what it is. Stereo something or other. Anyways those are the basic models but they need to be converted into a file that the 3D printer can read and slice. And that file once it's converted is called a g-code file and essentially what it is is it's a program that tells the printer how much filament to feed through and where to feed it as it's building the model. So you've seen this earlier. This is my thimble garbage can. Now the thing about the slicer program is you can alter the size and you can do some basic editing. So I have used the slicer program to take several different models and merge them together into a new object. You saw that when I showed you the gnome pin cushions. Those were two separate models. One was this thimble and one was one of the gnomes and I just merged them together to create that form. Now there are other programs out there, CAD programs, that allow you to create right from scratch your own models and then make those into STL files which eventually you can pull up in a slicer and make into a file that your printer can print. I don't know how to use those. They have a very steep learning curve and yeah, I'm just not that interested. Not when there's thousands and thousands of things that I can already pick up and the work's already been done for me on like something like Thingiverse. But just to give you an example here, here's this basic thimble and I can change the side size. And right now I've got it set at 50% of its original size. I can go much bigger if I go to say 75 or I can go much smaller. And there are several ways to change the sizes and the orientation even. I could move this to its on its side or whatever, upside down. I can take a look at what this is going to look like from different perspectives as well. And this box over here, which I'm not going to explain, is a lot of fine tuning for temperatures of the plastic, um, how it's going to print it out, how thick parts of it will be, things like that. 
I don't generally generally play too much with these settings except for probably the temperature because well uh, different plastics take different pe temperatures for melting but once I have this the way I want it then I hit a button here that says slice and I'm not going to do that because it takes it a few minutes to do but basically what it is is converting this file into a file that can be read by the 3d printer and then you save it to your computer now how do I get it to my printer well that's easy I put in a little SD memory card into my computer and I just copy this file onto that and then that little card goes into the side of my 3d printer and I call it up in the printer and away we go now I'm making this sound very straightforward and it is fairly straightforward for very simple things but the more complex the model the original model is the more uh, fiddling you have to do with it and the more adjustments you have to make on your actual printer to get it to work right so this is not a plug-and-play kind of thing it does take some time to learn and not everything that you create in the slicer is necessarily going to print well on your printer it's basically trial and error but that's how I create all these things and you can see there's a whole lot of them uh, that are related to both quilting and sewing now here's something that's going to blow your mind if you are an electric quilt 8 user you know there is a feature in electric quilt when you've designed your blocks for whatever your project you're putting together that you can actually print paper templates so if you've got a very complex block and you need a special template for it you can print them out with it uh with it, uh electric quilt however you're printing them on paper so what's that mean you take the paper and you trace it out on on uh template material which is very thin still and you know take your time with a rotary cutter going around it or cutting it out or tracing them out on your fabric and cutting them with scissors all of it is tedious well there is in electric quilt there is an add-on program called block base block base has additional blocks in it and it goes along with the beckman book that's the encyclopedia of quilt blocks and i have that but in that add-on program you can take a template that would be printed out on paper and convert it to what's called an SVG file. Now, those of you that may have a Cricut or a Scan and Cut know what an SVG file is. It is uh, an electric, a file that works with an electronic cutter. But again, that's only good for cutting, well, paper or fabric, like, and they're not that efficient in cutting out, you know, applique pieces or block pieces. Uh, with them because they don't run that fast and there's a lot of setup involved for cutting fabric with most of those machines wouldn't it be nice if you could just print out your own templates in plastic and didn't have to pay, buy, pay for them because they're very expensive when you buy them in the store now mind you what you're buying in a quilt store is made of high grade see-through acrylic plastic you can't get completely see-through plastic for 3d printers like that you can get something that's called transparent but it looks more like frosted glass kind of a thing so you can't really see all that well through it but if you don't need to see through it you can make templates so how do you do that well i'm going to show you how to do that so here's an exciting option if you own electric quilt and you own the add-on program Block Base Plus, which has all kinds of blocks from the um, Beckman book, then you can make your own templates for complicated blocks. So what you see on the screen right now is Block Base Plus, and I've gone into the section that has some of the star uh, blocks to it, and I've selected this first one just for the uh, for illustration purposes so the first thing I have to do if I want to make this into a 3d printable template that I can use for cutting out my pieces for this block I first need to change this 
into an SVG file. And in BlockBase, it's very easy. I highlight the, the star that I want in this case. I click on Export, and it's going to give me a menu with three different options. I pick the SVG file. And then it's going to ask me some various things here, and I'm not going to get into details about this because it's um, a little bit more, not difficult, but there's a lot this can do. But I'm going to select Export Block Templates. And um, I've just got it all set up here. It's kind of the default. I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to click on Export, and then it's going to come into my uh, directories and it's, it's going to ask me what I want to call it and where I want to put it and I've done that already. So once I have that it's been converted to a, an SVG file which is a cutting file. It's the kind of file you'd use in a Cricut or even in a scan and cut. Um, then you need to put it into another program where you can make it into the STL file which is the file that the slicer for a 3D printer reads. So I have already done that in a free pro online program called Tinkercad. And I have uh, imported it into this program and you can see these are all my various pieces. Now, of course, I would do some editing in here. Um, these pieces are very large. I want to adjust their size, move them around on the build plate. That's what they call this area here. And then when I have it the way I want it, I would save it and it would save it as an STL file. Then I would go into the file uh, Cura or a slicer file. It doesn't necessarily have to be Cura and call it up. And here are all my templates laid out on my bed. Now these right now, I haven't done any adjustment on size. I'd have to tinker around with that. Uh, but the point of all of this is with a 3D printer, I could make my own plastic templates for cutting a complicated block and yes it will take a little bit of time to do it but you are saving a lot of money by doing that um you know templates can be expensive however having said that it will take some time to get these the way you want them and it's going to take a little bit more time to print them out so you know maybe this isn't up your alley, maybe you would just rather just buy a template and be done with it. But this is the potential of a 3D printer uh, for quilting. Now, of course, the drawback of, of doing your making your own templates is the fact that you have to know how to use the software in order to do that, and it takes a long time. Not only that, you have to have a 3D printer that you uh know how to maintain yeah and things like that so it's not just it's not plug and play as i said however the potential is there it can be done and i have done it um but there's another thing you can use 3d printers for what else can you do with 3d printers or can you print you can print replacement feet for your sewing machine there's tons of those you can print well in that video that you've just seen on there, I showed you all the things that come up that are related to um, sewing and quilting. I don't think I would print my own feet with it because this plastic isn't that strong. There are some plastics that you can get that are much and, stronger. And sometimes, depending on what you have, uh, they can break fairly easily. Yeah. So, you know, it's a nice idea, but I don't recommend it. Some people print uh, sewing parts. You can find things if a part has gone on your sewing machine, an older model sewing machine, we're talking pre-computerized sewing machines, you can print out a part for it. Never bothered with that. I, I don't... You might that. have to use a special type of filament yeah, for that. Yeah, for it. And if you... And, and that takes uh, extra effort, so... Yeah. You can print out rulers um, as well. Now, the problem with printing a ruler, though, as I said, if they you can't really see clearly through them so plus you'd have to make sure that your markings on the ruler are to scale yeah yeah then so there are some problems with that so it's not for the faint of heart you know if you don't want to fool around you don't want to be bothered with it not for you okay? personally i think it's better just to buy rulers that yeah that are already pre-manufactured they're see-through and they and they do the job, whereas uh, a ruler that you would print 
on a 3D printer wouldn't, wouldn't be, be that great. No. Um, I mean, uh, you could if you were really stuck. If you're really stuck or something, or there was a special kind of thing. More more the template idea. Yeah. Uh, because there are templates that you can download as well. And some of them are, are fairly, um, you know, elaborate. They have like a, they've built in a, like a knob on top of them for holding them down as you trace around them or cut around them and things like that. There's lots of things out there and there's new things all the time coming out that people design. Uh, and there's tens of thousands and they're free. For the most part, they are absolutely free. So I hope that more or less explained what I do with my 3D printers for you. Um, I hope it, it gave you some thoughts about this technology. You know, we tend to use technologies in a box. My sewing machine does this. My embroidery machine does this. My serger does this. My computer does this. My 3D printer does this. But it's, why not use them in harmony? It's not to say that the 3D printers that we have today will improve. Oh, and they're and, always improving. And someday you'll get one that you can get that's a plug and play that doesn't require any kind of maintenance or something like that. And they do have them, but they're on the pricier end. Yeah, they're very expensive. So, and some days they'll be, they'll invent them in such a way that they'll be so fast that it'll be like a re replicator on Star Trek. You just dial Earl Grey, hot. You know, and bang, you know, I need eight inch ruler square. Boom. It's there. But we're not there to that yet, the technology. But it's amazing how far the technology has come in just in the two years that I've had these machines. So, yeah. But I just thought maybe you'd like to see something just a little bit different um, from the usual kind of, of thing that we could be talking about here. And thanks to the subscriber, and I forget who it was who asked about this. So, yeah. So we're always looking for ideas. We're so chatty. So please, if you've got some ideas, and it doesn't matter how out there they might sound at first, there may be a kernel of something that I can work with in them. So cost you nothing to give me an idea. So we'll go for it. Okay. So that's it today. Any parting words, Walter? No. Well, you're a man of few, few words. Not really. Um, okay. So we'll see you next week. I don't know what we're talking about next week, but we have a long list of things. Thanks to all of you. So we'll see you then. Have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Say goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, Walter.